Tougher penalties for those who fail to comply with compulsory testing mandates or quarantine orders. Britain withdraws its judges from Hong Kong's top court. And Ukraine reacts with skepticism to Russia's promise to scale down military operations around Kyiv. Good evening and welcome. The government has raised the maximum fine for those who fail to comply with a compulsory testing mandate or quarantine order. The new maximum fines are $25,000 and $10,000 respectively. That is on top of a maximum jail term of six months. But experts say the new penalties which will take effect tomorrow may not be as effective as expected. Sharon Tang reports. Earlier, the government halted the arrangement requiring visitors of virus-hit premises to undergo compulsory testing. The public, however, must still hold a vaccine pass and scan the Leave Home Safe QR code before entering places like shopping malls. But at least for this mall in Mong Kok, not many complied with the rules. This woman said, actually, there used to be someone who made sure you scan the QR code and now no more. Now, measures are being tightened with more serious consequences for those who fail to follow the rules. The government announced that starting Thursday, those who breach a compulsory testing mandate will be fined $25,000 up from the previous $10,000 and face a maximum six-month jail term. The parents or guardian of a child who do not undergo compulsory testing may also face penalties. As for people who contravene an isolation or quarantine order, they will face a maximum fine of $10,000 and six months behind bars. Still, infectious disease expert Leung Chi Chiu said the tougher penalties would have little effect because the government has failed to focus on the root causes of the problems. He cited the issue that most COVID patients with mild symptoms can undergo home quarantine now. Leung said home quarantine was introduced because there were not enough quarantine facilities. But with COVID infection numbers falling, he thinks the authorities should consider letting patients undergo quarantine at isolation facilities instead of living in their homes. The expert added that existing compulsory testing mandates mainly target residential sites. He said they should be extended to workplaces in order to detect more silent transmissions. Sharon Tang, TVB News. Hong Kong reported 6,981 new COVID infections, showing a decline in confirmed cases for five consecutive days. 117 more COVID patients died. Meanwhile, the authorities clarified that parents are allowed to stay with hospitalized children who are infected with the coronavirus in order to try and quash the claim that children are forcibly left alone. The HA would allow the parents to stay with uh, the hospital minors as far as, far as uh, practical under permissible situation in isolation facilities. So in any case, if we cannot provide video visiting and also phone calls will be arranged having regard to the situation and circumstances, even for parents or carer who are test negative for the COVID. And we will set agreement uh, for, of the CHP so that the public hospital can also accommodate that request for uh, accompanying the need of the pediatric. Sarah Ho, a chief manager at the hospital authority, added that a clinical team will provide updates to parents regarding the clinical progress of the infected children. Chief Executive Carrie Lam today admitted the city's tough anti-epidemic measures have driven many business talents away from Hong Kong over the past two years. But she insists the government will be able to restore their confidence in the city, citing its advantages as an international financial hub. Christy Khan reports. A recent survey conducted by the European Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong found nearly half of the European firms here have plans to leave the city. The government has come under criticism from different sectors that stringent anti-epidemic measures have contributed to the departure of business talents in the past two years. Speaking at her regular pandemic briefing today, Chief Executive Carrie Lam acknowledged the tough measures have affected the business environment. 
but she insisted the measures are necessary. The well-being of the public is always the top priority, and in this regard, we had to take out anti-epidemic measures. These measures would more or less affect individuals and companies, but in order to protect the well-being of Hong Kong people, we don't want Hong Kong to become a loophole of imported cases. Lam revealed that she had a virtual meeting with diplomats and representatives of the business community to address their concerns yesterday. She said the parties welcomed the relaxation of the anti-COVID measures, emphasizing no one cares more about Hong Kong's international status than herself. Lam said she will try to strive for balance between the anti-epidemic work and the city's business development. Meanwhile, Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury, Christopher Hui, said the government will continue to create opportunities for the business sector and nurture the city's talent pool. If we look at the place where people or companies try to locate their business, definitely opportunities and talent are the key. I think all these efforts will continue and also continue to be strengthened in such a way that Hong Kong will continue to open the business to the rest of the world. Carrie Lam also said Hong Kong as a financial hub still offers many opportunities when the pandemic is over. Christy Khan, TVB News. Well, the government will distribute those anti-epidemic service bags to all households in the city starting Friday. The chief executive and senior officials today inspected the packaging process, but lawmakers say details of the distribution process are still unclear. A hundred volunteers helped with the packaging at the Tai Wo Hao Sports Center. The service bags include items like face masks and rapid antigen test kits. Alice Mack, an election committee constituency lawmaker, also joined in. Helpers at this center said 36,000 service bags are expected to be wrapped within three days. While well, some volunteers say they want to help, others say they still haven't been informed when and where exactly the distribution will take place. Currently, authorities will only supply anti-COVID pills to facilities such as public hospitals, designated clinics and treatment facilities, but not holding centers. The chief executive officer of the Elderly Commission membership, Grace Lee, has criticized this practice. She questioned why the medicine is not available for elderly patients who have mild symptoms in the holding centers. The hospital authority responded by saying most of the holding centers are for admitting asymptomatic patients. Most of them don't have an urgent need for antiviral prescriptions. But authorities do not rule out the possibility that the holding centers will be able to prescribe anti-COVID pills in the future. The mainland reported about 8,600 new COVID infections, including 5,982 cases in Shanghai, a new high for the city. The vast majority of the cases are asymptomatic. Millions are enduring a third day of Shanghai's two-phase lockdown. So far, more than 9 million residents in the Pudong Financial District and adjacent areas have been screened for COVID. The more populated western area, Puxi, on the opposite side of the Huangpo River, uh, will also be sealed off for five days of mass testing. Apart from the Shanghai World Expo Exhibition and Convention Center, the new International Expo Center has also been converted into a temporary isolation facility with 14,000 beds. Starting today, Shanghai also began month-long citywide sanitation exercises at commercial buildings, construction sites, and public transport systems. Britain is withdrawing its judges from Hong Kong's top court. UK Supreme Court President Lord Robert Reid and Vice President Lord Patrick Hodge have both submitted their resignation from the Court of Final Appeal. Both cited concerns over the national security law. Reid says the, judgments, the judges cannot continue to sit in Hong Kong without appearing to endorse an administration which has departed from the values of political freedom to which the justices of Supreme Court are deeply committed. Secretary for Justice Theresa Cheng said the constitutional bedrock that supports Hong Kong's judiciary independence will not be shaken. British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss supports the withdrawal of serving UK judges. 
In a statement, Trust says they've seen a systematic erosion of liberty and democracy in Hong Kong. The two resigning judges were among the eight British judges serving in Hong Kong's Court of Final Appeal. Six other appointees have already retired. Istanbul talks that saw Russia saying it will scale back military operations around Kiev and Chernihiv have been greeted with skepticism. The Pentagon interpretation claims it is a repositioning that could lead to intensified fighting in other areas of Ukraine. Matthew Bray reports. This is part of the Russian delegation in Istanbul laying out plans to reduce military activity near Kyiv and surrounds. Moscow portrayed it as a goodwill gesture despite the fact they are taking heavy losses. President Volodymyr Zelensky said Ukrainian troops had forced Moscow's hand and that the nation would not be letting down its guard anytime soon. He added the signals were positive, but he would not be compromising on territory and sovereignty. In the Kyiv suburb of Irpin, evidence of brutal fighting between the Ukraine and Russia. The former taking back now deserted streets. This should be one of the areas that Russia is pulling back from. That will become clearer in the next few days. Another region near Kyiv. Soldiers here report far less action from Russian forces. This farmer said, now I only have 15 cows. I used to have goats, greenhouses until Putin messed things up. In the south, in Mykolaiv, an explosion ripped apart a government building targeted by Russian forces. According to the governor, Vitaly Kim, seven civilians were killed, 22 others managed to get out with varying degrees of injuries. Mykolaiv is a strategic entry point to several other Black Sea ports. If seized, it will cut Ukraine's access to its coast. Russian state TV released more footage of street fighting in the largely devastated city of Mariupol. The footage also features a basement with wounded people and newly born babies. According to the report, the outskirts of the city are under the control of the Donetsk People's Republic. In Moscow, Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, the subject of speculation recently over his whereabouts, gave a briefing in which he said that liberating Donbass was now the main goal of the military operation. Matthew Bray, TVB News. U.S. and Western officials say they are not convinced about Russia's announcement that it will dial back some military operations to increase mutual trust in talks between Ukrainian and Russian officials. And so far, the reality check from the West appears to match the reality on the ground. During a meeting with Singapore's prime minister, the U.S. president was asked whether the announced Russian pullback was a sign that negotiations to rein in the invasion are showing progress, or, as critics suggest, is it merely an indication that Russia is trying to buy time to continue its assault on Ukraine? We'll see. I don't read anything into it until I see what their actions are. We'll see if they follow through on what they're suggesting. Biden was set to discuss the latest developments with European Union leaders while the White House tempered expectations. No one should be fooled by Russia's announcements. We believe any movement of forces from around Kyiv is a redeployment and not a withdrawal. In northern Chernihiv region tends to agree. Uh, Do we believe in it? Of course not, said Vyacheslav Chaus in a video address today. He said Moscow's promise to scale down military operations there were demonstrated as airstrikes on civilian targets all night long. Britain is mirroring U.S. skepticism. The door to diplomacy will always be left ajar, but I don't think you can trust what is coming out of the mouth of Putin's war machine. British intelligence says it's highly likely that Russia will seek to divert combat power to offensives in the east, adding that Russian units suffering heavy losses in Ukraine are being forced to pull back in an effort to regroup. Beijing and Moscow, meanwhile, agreed today to widen cooperation at a meeting of their foreign ministers in Anhui province on the mainland. Tom West, the U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan, will attend a separate meeting at the same venue. But that meeting does not include the Chinese and Russian ministers. Amid what Moscow described as difficult international conditions, China and Russia say they will build up foreign policy coordination, speak with one voice on global affairs. That's according to the Interfax News Agency, which cited Russia's foreign ministry. 
The cooperation came after Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi met with his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, in Tunxi, in the eastern province of Anhui. China is hosting two days of meetings on Afghanistan. The talks come amid Russia's invasion of Ukraine and an economic and humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan following the Taliban takeover last year. Still ahead on tonight's news, the city's number of minibuses continues to be capped at about 4,300. Palestinian gunman kills five in central Israel before being shot dead by police. Welcome back to TVB News. The Legislative Council has passed a resolution capping the number of minibuses on the road at about 4,300. But lawmakers hope there could be a long-term blueprint for these public light buses down the road, especially in the face of competition from expanding train networks. Jackie Lin has more. 4,350. That's the limit for the number of public minibuses in Hong Kong since 1976. And that figure is here to stay for five more years till June 2027. This as lawmakers voted in favor of the government's motion to stick with the minibus limit in that show's online meeting. In defense of the resolution, Secretary for Transport and Housing Frank Chan said any revision now could create more fierce and vicious competition between different transport services. Given that the total patronage of the public transport system is unlikely to change drastically in the foreseeable future, adjusting the total number of PLBs at this stage may upset the balance of the roles and functions of other transport modes and trigger latent conflict. There are more than 3,300 green minibuses running on fixed routes, and 1,000 are privately owned, potentially free-roaming red minibuses. Between 2017 and 2019, their daily passenger loads remained stable, accounting for around 14 percent of the market share. In today's meeting, apart from flagging issues surrounding speed driving and aging demographics among some red minibus drivers, some legislators call for clearer policy directions for the minibuses. Cake is only so big, um, and then the railway services keep expanding, and of course then there is uh, less room for survival or other forms of public transport. And that's why there's imbalance in the uh, public transport ecosystem. There has to be a long-term development strategy for the PLB sectors. In response, the transport chief said the government has already allowed more flexibility for fare and route adjustments for the light buses. Jacqueline TVB News. Israeli forces today raided a Palestinian village in the occupied West Bank a day after a gunman kill, uh, from the village killed five people in central Israel. Tuesday's shooting in a Tel Aviv suburb was the third such deadly attack in Israel in a week. The gunman was shot dead by police. The man, a Palestinian from a village near Jenin in the West Bank, shot people with an assault rifle walking down a road in Nebrak. He killed four civilians and a police officer before other police shot him. The incident brought to 11 the number of people killed by Arab gunmen in Israel over the past week. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, addressing the nation, called it a wave of murderous Arab terror. Nebrak is an ultra-Orthodox city east of Tel Aviv. That's the news. Thanks for watching. Good night.